this is a very important study because I think one of the biggest issues that people, um, uh, that Christians struggle with is law versus grace. Uh, most every church denomination has a different view on that. You know, some teach eternal security, others teach that you can lose your salvation or you have to work for your salvation. And uh, regardless of what position you take, there's always uh, verses that people will use to try to prove the opposite. You know, if you're eternal security, they'll try to bring the law in on, on you. And I think, uh, I think a lot of us, even if you are confident that we are eternally secure in Christ, um, there are still some passages in your Bible that maybe you don't understand or you think, well, how can this be true? It seems like it's teaching conditional salvation or that you can lose your salvation. And so I think that tonight, I'm hoping, the goal of tonight is to really clear all that up. And um, also, another thing that you'll have is, especially among people who rightly divide the word of truth, is they will say that, well, today you believe the gospel, you receive the gift of eternal life, and then you're not under the law, you're under grace. And so then you can't lose your salvation. But they'll say for Israel that they can lose their salvation because they're, or at least they need to keep, un, because they're under the law, they have to do these works. And the problem with that view is that it's the same problem with us today. You know, if we are under the law after we are saved, well, you know, you look, for example, look in uh, James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So, we can use a verse like that and say, Okay, well, you know, we have to be eternally secure in Christ, because all I have to do is break the law in one point, I'm guilty of it all. Um, so there are no big sins or small sins when it comes to my salvation. So if my salvation is kept by me keeping the law, and all I have to do is break the law in one point and I'm guilty of it, well, I'm going to break the law and I'll lose my salvation. Especially in light of what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, well, if you have hatred in your heart toward your brother, you have killed him in your heart. If you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. The sin is from within, Jesus says in Mark 7. It's, uh, the outward is just a manifestation of what is in the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, uh, the mouth speaketh. So, the problem that we, we can let, the, my point is, and among right dividers, a lot of times they'll look at a passage like James 2, 10 and 11, and they'll say, well, because uh, we're all going to break the law at some point, we're all going to sin, uh, there are no big or little sins. The sin comes from within. So if I'm under the law, then I would lose my salvation. So if I had to keep the law in order to keep my salvation, I would lose it. Then I had to get resaved again. So we have to have eternal security. But yet, it seems like we don't really address that problem when it comes to Israel. Because they say, oh, well, that's their program. They're under the law. And it's like we don't worry about it. But what we're going to find out tonight is really God's plan whether you are in Israel's program under the law or whether you are in the dispensation of grace, you are kept by the grace of God. God gives you, when you believe the gospel, God gives you eternal life and you cannot lose it regardless of if you are in Israel's program or you're in the dispensation of grace. And we're going to go over verses to see that tonight. Look at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 gives you the fundamental principle, and I think I've probably read this passage more than any others on this Tuesday night study that we've had, uh, but it bears repeating because so many people get tripped up in the law and don't really understand its purpose. Churchianity will teach that 
you do a lot of bad things, but once you come to the church and get saved, well, then you need to keep the Ten Commandments. But God says the opposite. He says in Galatians 3, verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So God has us under the law. He keeps us under the law until we believe the gospel. Once we believe the gospel, we've learned the lesson of the law, that we are sinners and that we cannot save ourselves. And so then when we learn that lesson, we are justified by the faith of Christ. The faith of Christ is given to us when we trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sins. And then that schoolmaster of the law is taken away from us in terms of its effect on our eternal life. Because people will say, well, yeah, you're not under the law, but shouldn't you keep the law? Well, yes, but that's not affecting your salvation. In terms of how you're saved, you're saved by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ atones for all your sins. And it doesn't matter if you keep the law or not. And since you learn the lesson of the law, that you are a sinner and you need God to save you, then once you learn that lesson, you're no longer under the law, but under grace. Look also over in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, talking to believers here, it says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So once you believe the gospel, there are no works that you have to do to maintain your salvation. You are complete in Christ. And in fact, you go to verse 14, Colossians, well, let's look at verse 13, Colossians 2, 13, it says, You being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So the moment that you believe the gospel, Colossians 2.13 says you are made alive or quickened together with Christ, that all your trespasses are forgiven, and then the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that's the law. That's blotted out. It's taken out of the way. Romans 6.14 says, Ye are not under the law, but under grace. So contrary to popular opinion among churchianity, the law is not given for you to keep it. The law is given to teach you the lesson that you are a sinner. And once you learn that lesson and believe the gospel, then God says, I, the, you've learned the lesson of the law. I'm taking it out of the way. And that's actually the same case as we'll see later on today. It's the same thing for the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and this is starting in verse 7 here. There are these people who, they're a lot like what you see in churchianity. You have people who uh, don't understand the grace of God. These denominations, these churches, the people in those, that teach in those, they don't understand the grace of God, and they decide to put people under the law. And Paul says here that these people, in 1 Timothy 1, 7, he says that these people are desiring to be teachers of the law, which is what you see in churchianity. You don't see grace being taught. You see them saying, repent, and then they'll say, turn from your sins, and be water baptized, and they confess your sins, and keep you know, short accounts with God, and they, you've got to keep prayed up, and make sure you don't have any unconfessed sins on your life, or else you'll lose fellowship with God. So they're desiring to be teachers of the law, but then it says, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. And that's what I've been talking about is they think that once you come to the church, then we put you under the Ten Commandments. But the fact of the matter is, is that, as we saw in Galatians 3, you're under the law until you're saved. And then once you're saved, then God takes that out of the way, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, 
nailing it to his cross. You see in verse 8 there, 1 Timothy 1, 8, he says, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Okay, how, if we're, it says the law is good if we use it lawfully. So how do we use it lawfully? Verse 9 tells you, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. So if you're a believer, according to that, the law is not made for you. Now I understand after you're saved, if you allow Christ to live in you, you will naturally obey the law. But the purpose of the law isn't, the purpose of the law is to show your sin and need of a Savior. And then even after you're saved, it's to allow Christ to live in you, to live by the faith of the Son of God. God says that the, the, uh, the law, Jesus, a uh, man came to Jesus, a lawyer, and says, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So after you're saved, God isn't interested in you saying, okay, here are all these laws, i got to make sure I do them. God's interested in having the love of Christ come through you. And if the love of Christ comes through you, then you'll naturally obey the Lord. And you'll obey those commandments. But the purpose of the law was to show you that you don't obey. Then, once you're saved, then the love of God can come through you, and then you'll naturally um, be serving the Lord. So it says there in verse 9, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persers, per, persons. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. So, if you are living in sound doctrine, according to those verses, you don't need the law. It's only if you are contrary to sound doctrine, and you're these things in this list here, you're not righteous, but you're an unbeliever, then the law is for you. And remember, the last couple of weeks, we spent time talking about the nation of Israel and showing how they lived in apostasy, unbelief, the entire time. Led across the Red Sea, they saw the ten plagues that God sent upon Egypt. They saw the miracles that God did to get those two million people, those Israelites, out of Egypt. And yet, three days later, they're murmuring against God. They're unbelievers. God sends, uh, comes down upon the mount to meet with Moses to give him the law. And Israel abandons God, making a golden calf and bowing down to it. The reason that you see the law emphasized so much in the Old Testament, and you don't see it under grace in the dispensation of grace, is all those Old Testament books are written about unbelievers, for the most part. I mean, there are, you know, we saw Abraham, we saw Moses, Joshua, Caleb. There are a handful of believers, but for the most part, your Old Testament is history about a nation, the nation of Israel, that was in unbelief. So if you're in unbelief, you are lawless. So that means the law, God says, i got to use it lawfully. I've got to use it for the lawless, disobedient, ungodly sinners, that whole list that we read there. That's why there's such an emphasis on the law in the Old Testament. When you're in Paul's epistles, Paul is not writing to unbelievers. Paul is writing to people who are already saved in the body of Christ. So that's why we're not under the law, but we're under grace. Giving an example of, of how God treats Israel in their program, look over in Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, there's this rich young ruler who comes to Jesus Start in verse 16. Matthew 19, verse 16 says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? You see, he hasn't recognized, for you to be saved, regardless of what dispensation you're in, there are two steps to being saved. The first 
is to recognize you are a sinner. The second step is to believe the gospel that God has given you. And then you are saved. It's as easy as that. Regardless, doesn't matter when you live, you know, what nation you're in, doesn't matter. Those are the two steps. Recognize your sin and believe the gospel that God has given you. This man, <coughs> excuse me, this man obviously doesn't recognize he's a sinner because the first thing he does is he says, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So this guy is an unbeliever. Remember Galatians 3.24, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law is there to teach you that you are a sinner. This man hasn't learned that lesson yet. So Jesus says to him, verse 17, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. He wants him to learn the lesson of Romans 3. There is none good, no, not one. There is none righteous, no, not one. And so Jesus says, well, basically what he's telling him is the first thing you need to do is recognize that you're a sinner. You think he called him good master. Now, of course, Jesus is different. He's not a sinner. But normally when you look at people, you shouldn't say, oh, that's a good person over there. Spiritually speaking, if they're an, um, a, you know, spiritually speaking, no one in their flesh is good. Romans 7, 18 says, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So he asks the question there in verse 17, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Okay, all of us know that he is not, this guy is not going to get eternal life by keeping the commandments. Because Romans 3, 23, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This when Jesus says, if thou will enter into life, keep the commandments, he is not giving him the gospel. The gospel is good news. This is bad news. This guy is not going to keep the commandments perfectly without sinning for his entire life. It's not going to happen. So if this is the way to eternal life, this is bad news. But Jesus, again, like Galatians 3.24, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. This isn't the gospel or the salvation plan that Jesus is giving the rich young ruler. This is him showing the law to him to show that he's, he's failed, that he needs God to save him. He cannot trust in his own righteousness. So verse 18, he saith unto him, which? Which commandment? So Jesus gives him a list. Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? Again, this guy has not recognized his sin. The law was to teach him that he's a sinner. Jesus gives him, how many commandments? One, two, three, four, five, six commandments. You figure he's got to have broken at least one of those, right? But this guy is so arrogant in his own pride, saying, I've done them perfectly. So then Jesus says, okay. He knew the guy was rich, so he says, okay, I got one that I know you haven't kept. Verse 21, Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. So he gives him another commandment is, and at the at-hand phase of the kingdom, they were to sell all that they have. You see that at the end of Acts 2, at the end of Acts 4. So that is a commandment for them at that time. It's not for us today. So he gives them that commandment. And then verse 22 says, When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He didn't ask God for mercy. He didn't say, I can't keep it perfectly. I lust after money. Apparently he loved money which is the root of all evil, loving money. So apparently he did that because he wouldn't give up his money for eternal life in God's kingdom. So instead of asking for mercy, asking, well, how do I, how, how do I get saved then? He goes away sorrowful. He won't recognize his sin. He just chooses to ignore it and goes away. Verse 25, you notice, it says, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? 
See, that's what Jesus is trying to get at. That's the proper response to these commandments is no one can obey them all. So if I've got to obey the commandments to get life, who then can be saved? That's the question that Jesus was desiring that the rich young ruler would ask. But he didn't. He went away sorrowful. Jesus gives him the answer in verse 26. Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It is impossible for me, you, or anyone else to enter into life by keeping the commandments because all of us fail in doing so. So he says, with men this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. God has to give you His righteousness by you believing the gospel. You can't do it yourself. That's what that story is telling you. And that's essentially what you see in the Old Testament. You think of today in the dispensation of grace. If you recognize you're a sinner and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, God gives you the gift of eternal life. If you choose not to believe, then God will judge you based upon your works. So if you're a believer, you're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 says that. It says you're you're going to judge, be based upon your works to see what kind of reward you get. But it says regardless of getting a reward or not getting a reward, it says you will be saved. It says you, your soul will be saved, yet so as by fire. So for all believers, we all receive eternal life. God judges us as to whether we have eternal life or we have death and hell. God makes that determination based because we're believers he does it based upon the shed blood of Jesus Christ being applied to our sins for all unbelievers in the dispensation of grace they're going to appear at their great white throne judgment seen in Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15 they're going to be judged by their works and since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death those people will end up in hell so today when you're walking out, you meet people. Everybody you meet is in one of those two categories. God will either judge them by their works because they're unbelievers and they'll go to hell. Or God will judge them by the blood of Christ because they believe the gospel and they will have eternal life. And what we're going to see for the rest of today's lesson is the exact same thing holds true in the Old Testament. And, but the reason that you see the law so much in the Old Testament, whereas you see grace in Paul's epistles, is because by and large, as we saw the last two weeks, those in Israel were unbelievers. Look over in Acts 7 to give you a, to an example of that. Because in Acts 7, Stephen sums up, through the Holy Ghost, by the way, it's the Holy Ghost speaking through Stephen in Acts 7, and he sums up Israel's history. He starts at, uh, you know, there in verse, uh, in verse 2, Acts 7, verse 2, and he talks about the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham. So he starts with Abraham, there, way back there in Genesis 12. And he goes all the way to present time, you know, down in verse, uh, let's see, verse 12, you've got Jacob, verse 14 is Joseph. Uh, verse 20 talks about Moses um, leading people through the, through the wilderness there. Verse 36, they go across the Red Sea. They're in the wilderness 40 years. Um, then he talks about them turning from God, as we talked about last week. Uh, you get Solomon in verse 47. He goes through their whole history, and then he concludes in verse 51, Acts 7:51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. So, just like the rich young ruler, Jesus only gave him the law. The law was his schoolmaster to bring him unto Christ. Once he believed that he was a sinner, then he could give him the gospel and be saved. But, he never got to that point. Israel's history is like that. They're in unbelief. They're stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears. They do always resist the Holy Ghost. And so time after time after time in the Old Testament, you will see God continually giving the law to them. 
Not that he expects him to keep it, just like with the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. Jesus did not expect him to keep it. He gives them the law to teach them that they can't keep it and they need to trust in God to save them. Whereas when you're reading Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, God is talking to people who have already believed the gospel. So God doesn't need to bring up the law saying, believe it. Remember Colossians 2.14. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, was contrary to us, taking it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So that's why you don't see the law emphasis in Paul's epistles, because it's taken out of the way. But you see the law emphasized in Israel's program in the Old Testament, because the law is not taken away, because they haven't learned the lesson of the law due to their unbelief, as we've covered in the last couple of weeks. And so, to, sh to give you an illustration of this, and you'll see it if you read through... On, on your own time, and say you read through First and Second Kings, for example, and it goes through all these different kings. And God will give the same promise over and over to the king. He'll say, if you will obey my commandments, if you will do what I've told you to do, then you will be established as my king. But if you break them, you're not going to be my king. The kingdom will be taken away from you. Over and over, there's an emphasis on the law. Again, it's not that God expects them to keep it but it's to teach them that they can't keep it and they need to be justified by faith, by believing the gospel to them. And for them, you say, well, what is the gospel? Well, in the Old Testament, the gospel was simply to believe that God would give them his righteousness if they trusted him to give it to them rather than in their own good works. Um, today, we trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection because that is the way that we are saved and God's revealed that to us through the Apostle Paul. But that the details of that were not given in the Old Testament. So those in the Old Testament are not presented with that. They just need to learn that they are sinners and to trust in God to save them. So I want to give you, to give you an example to show you, just like I mentioned, if you're an unbeliever, God's going to judge you based on your works and you will end up in hell because all have sinned. If you are a believer... God will judge you based upon the cross work of Christ and will give you eternal life in heavenly places. To give you, it's the same exact thing that happens really in, um, in the Old Testament. And to show that to you, we're going to look at Saul versus David. So look over in 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12. In 1 Samuel, I think it's around chapter 9. Uh, chapter 9, they're, they're anointed. It's chapter 8. In 1 Samuel 8, Israel comes to Samuel and they say, we don't have a king. All these other nations have a king. We want to have a king just like all these other nations. We want to be like these other nations. And God tells Samuel, says, give them what they want. God says, I am their king. God is their king. That's why they don't have a man ruling over them. God says, I am their king. But they've rejected me as king. They want to be like the other nations. So I'll give them what they want. They want a man to rule over them. I'll give them a man. And he picks Saul. Saul is an unbeliever. And, uh, but God says he gives him the chance. Just like the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. What good thing can I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, keep the commandments. So it's the same offer God gives to Saul. He says, keep my commandments. If you keep them, you'll be fine. The point of that was so Saul could see, I can't keep them. I need your mercy. I need your help, God. I need God to save me. I can't do it on my own. I need God to give me his righteousness. So you see here in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 12, The Lord says unto, now he's talking to the nation of Israel as a whole, but, but look at what he says regarding Saul as their king. They're, that's their first king there after God. 1 Samuel 12, 13, the Lord says, 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, Now therefore, behold the king whom ye have chosen and whom ye have desired. In other words, they've rejected God as king. 
Now here's man's king. He's an unbeliever. Whom ye have chosen, whom ye have desired. And behold, the Lord hath set a king over you. If ye will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord. See, it's all about law there. If you're an unbeliever, God says the law is your schoolmaster to bring you under Christ. So he says, fear the Lord, serve him, obey his voice, don't rebel against the commandment of the Lord. Then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. Verse 15. But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. Jump down to verse 20. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 21. I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 12, verse 20. 1 Samuel 12, verse 20. Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart, and turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. Verse 25. But if ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. So here is a group of unbelievers, Israel, and God puts them under the law. The Lord tells them in verses 13 through 15, you must obey the voice of the Lord, or else uh, God will turn away from you. And then Samuel reminds them of that in verse 20, 21, and 25 that we read there. If ye shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. So guess what happens? Chapter 13. The very next chapter, chapter 13, there is uh, this battle took place. You see from verse 4, all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten a garrison of the Philistines. So there is a, this battle taking place between them and the Philistines. And then, um, and then God said in verse 8, after this is over, basically God had told Saul, says, okay, now the battle is over. Now Samuel was the, prophet, uh, the uh, priest um, who was going to, he was prophet as well, but Samuel was going to be the one who would be there for the sacrifices uh, in reverence of the Lord for the victory that uh, God gave them through, um, through Saul there. And so basically what God said is that Saul was to wait for Samuel to get there before offering the offering, the sacrifices. So verse 8 here, 1 Samuel 13, 8, and he, that's uh, Saul, he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So they're all waiting for Samuel to show up to give this sacrifice unto the Lord, people are getting tired of waiting. So after a week, they start leaving. Verse 9, And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. That's a bad thing because Saul is not the priest. Saul is the king. Saul is not in a position to offer these sacrifices. He was supposed to wait for Samuel. Verse 10, And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord." I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. You know, it's like, I didn't want to disobey, but I just forced myself to disobey. Verse 13, And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, that ends up being David. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. You see how the law works? You're put under the law in chapter 12. God says, 
you're an unbeliever, if you trust in me, I'll give you life. I'll make you king forever. No problem. I can do this. But you need to trust me. You need to have faith in me. If you don't have faith in me, then you're building your own kingdom. So, have at it. And if you obey me perfectly, then that's fine. But once you mess up, then I'm going to have to take the kingdom away from you. If you think of it this way, um, the Lord Jesus Christ never sinned. He always did the Father's will perfectly. And so, when I believe the gospel, the shed blood of Christ is atoned for my sins. I am taken out from being in Adam and I am placed into Christ. Colossians 3 says, Ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So when I mess up, when I sin after I'm saved, it doesn't affect my salvation one bit because I am dead and my life is hid with Christ in God. God looks at me and He doesn't see the sin that I committed. He sees the blood of Christ and He says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Therefore, there is no wrath to put upon me because, the blood, because all the wrath of God for my sin was already put on Christ. He suffered all that for me. So, we, I have peace with God. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By contrast, if I've never believe the gospel. I do not have a sin payment for my sins. The blood of Christ does not cover my sins because I have not, ex I have not believed the gospel. So then God looks at me, says, okay, well, you know, if you obey perfectly, God said, be ye holy for I am holy. So if I do it, if I'm holy, then God says, you can have life with me. Just like he said there in 1 Samuel, what was it, 1 Samuel 13, verse 13. He did not keep the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But Saul, because he wasn't a believer, he messed up one time. God has to punish him for his sin. There is no blood of Christ to atone for Saul because he does not believe the gospel. He did not trust in God to save him. So God says, verse 14, Now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. That man after his own heart is David. And the reason he's after his own heart, not that he's perfect, but he's a believer. So now let's look at what happens with David. So Saul, the kingdom is taken away from him. David is anointed king. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Today, in the dispensation of grace, when I believe the gospel, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, I am sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I have the Holy Spirit given unto me. He will never be taken away from me. Sam, uh, Saul, though, was not a believer. He was not justified by faith. So he was still under the law. So the moment Saul disobeyed the Lord's command, the Spirit of God left him. And now he's got an evil spirit. And the Spirit of the Lord comes upon David. God will never take his spirit away from David because he is a believer. Look at what happens with David. Now, remember Saul's sin. Saul's sin was that God says, wait for Samuel to get here and then offer the sacrifice. Saul didn't wait. God says, okay, kingdom taken away from you. Now let's look at what David did as king. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel Chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2. 2 Samuel 11, verse 2. And it came to pass in an eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. <clears throat> 
And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Okay, Bathsheba is the wife of Uriah. Verse 4, David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. Okay, hold your place there. Go over to Leviticus 20. If David is under the law, remember Samuel or Saul was under the law, he broke the law, he just offered the sacrifice at the wrong time. He didn't wait for Samuel. It doesn't seem like too big of a deal, right? I mean, he didn't commit adultery. Seems like just you offer, he offered a sacrifice to the Lord. I mean, offering sacrifice to the Lord, that's a good thing, isn't it? But God says obedience is better than sacrifice. So maybe it looks like a good thing to people, but the bottom line is he still disobeyed God. But either way, either way you look at it, David's sin is worse in terms of consequences because he committed adultery. Leviticus chapter 20, what does the law say about somebody like David who commits adultery? If he's under the law, what does the law say happens to him? Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10. Leviticus 20 and verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife even he that committed adultery with his neighbor's wife. Well, it's his neighbor. The woman lives right next door to him. The adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. The law says that David, if he's under the law, is to be put to death. Okay, go back to 2 Samuel 11 because David's sin did not stop there. He didn't just commit adultery, which is worthy of death under the law. But... Going back to 2 Samuel 11 and verse 5, it says the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Okay, now David can't keep this a secret. He committed adultery with Bathsheba and there's no getting around it. So what he does in verse 15, David wrote a letter to Joab, the guy who's the captain of his uh, army. Verse 15, he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. And, and, ver, and keep reading. It came to pass when Joab observed the city, that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew the valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. It was by commandment of David that Uriah died. So, David is an adulterer, and to cover, which is worthy of death under the law, and to cover up his adultery, he commits murder. Well, what does the law say about that? Go to Exodus 21. Exodus 21. Exodus 21 and verse 12. Exodus 21, verse 12. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor, Uriah is his neighbor, right next door to him, to slay him with guile, well, he slew him with guile all right, because he's afraid of getting caught, for committing adultery, thou shalt take him from my altar that he may die. So, David committed adultery. The law says he is to die for that. David committed murder. The law says he is to die for that. Now, we already saw what Saul did. He offered a sacrifice when he should have waited for Samuel to come along. And God says, I'm taking the kingdom away from him. He would have been king forever, but I'm taking it away because he offered the sacrifice, didn't wait. Okay, now you're thinking, well, David's punishment surely is going to be worse, right? You would think. But look at Psalm 32. Psalm 32, David writes regarding what he did there, the adultery 
and the murder. And it says in Psalm 32, verse 1, David says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile. God says to Saul, you offered the sacrifice at the wrong time, taking the kingdom away from you. God says to David, you committed adultery and you committed murder. Both of those things are worthy of death, but I've forgiven you of your sins. Now there were consequences to it. The baby that Bathsheba had in her womb ended up dying. The Lord uh, had that baby die. Um, but as far as David's soul is concerned, the Lord would not impute iniquity to him. And lest you think that David's not talking about himself, look, uh, look over in Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34. And see what God says about David in Ezekiel chapter 34. And this is talking about after Jesus' second coming. David, so this is David's status in God's eternal kingdom on earth. If he's judged by the law, he's not going to be in that kingdom because the law says adultery, you are to be killed. Murder, you are to be killed. But look at what God says about David in the coming eternal kingdom of God on earth. Ezekiel 34, 23. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David, he shall feed them and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Why does David get no... no uh, God does not impute sin to David's account, even though his sin, adultery and murder, murder is far worse than simply offering a burnt sacrifice at the wrong time. It's because Saul was an unbeliever, so he was still under the law. David was a believer, so God says, you're not under the law, you're under grace. You're a justified person. The law was your schoolmaster to bring you under Christ. You learned the lesson of the law, so the blood of Christ atones for your sin, even as bad as that sin was. So the law versus grace principle that we learn in the dispensation of grace applies in the Old Testament as well. And we're about out of time, but let me very quickly, I want to give you two more examples so you can see this. Look at Lot over in Genesis 19. If you know the story of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, if you read through that whole chapter, and you know, for time we won't do that, but if you... If you read through that, it doesn't seem like Lot, based upon his actions, is a safe person. You have uh, all the gross sin that was going on there. And verse 12, Genesis 19, 12, the men said unto Lot. Now the men there are the two angels that God sent to look at the city. The men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides? Son-in-law, thy sons, thy daughters, whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And so in verse 15, the morning comes, the angels tell Lot to, okay, let's go, time to get out. Verse 16, it says, while he lingered, the man laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. Lot wasn't going to leave. The two angels literally had to take him by the hand to force him out of the city. Then they say, okay, go ahead and let's get out of here. Get him out of the city. And then verse 18, Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. Thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and die. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto. It is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one, and my soul shall live? So basically, God tells Lot, I'm going to destroy the city. Get out of here. He lingers around, doesn't leave. 
God has to take him by the hand, dragging him out, or the angels do, the two angels drag him out of the city, say, okay, get up in the mountain. Oh, I'm not going up to that mountain. I'm going to die up there. Let's go, let me go to this other city. So then, he's in the city and he finds out, well, they're just as bad. So then verse 30, Lot went up out of Zoar, that was a city, and dwelt in the mountain. And his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. The two daughters in verse 32 said, Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they end up lying with their father, having kids by their father, and that's the end of the story of Lot. It says, verse 36, Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. Chapter 20, you go to Abraham. So you read Genesis 19. Ab Lot does not seem like a righteous man based upon his works. He won't leave Sodom. God has to drag him out of the city. Then when he's actually out of the city, he says, oh, I'm not going to go to the mountain like you told me to. I mean, if two angels told me of God, told me to go to this mountain, you know, I'd go to that mountain, not, not Lot. He's going to this other city. Then he's afraid in that city, he goes to the mountain. His two daughters sleep with him, and then now he's, he's both the father and the grandfather of two children. And that's how his story ends. Sounds like an unrighteous guy to me, right? Well, look at 2 Peter chapter 2. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. While that may be the end of the story for Lot in the book of Genesis... By revelation of the Holy Ghost, God tells Peter some information about Lot that he writes down. And it says in verse 6, 2 Peter 2, 6, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot. He's a justified man. The Holy Ghost in 2 Peter 2, 7 says Lot is a justified man. That he was vexed with the filthy conversation of the world, of the wicked. Verse 8, for that righteous man, Lot was righteous, dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. You read Genesis 19, you say, is Lot a, is a believer? No way. Not the way he behaved. Apparently he was. He just operated by the lust of his flesh. God calls him just. And he calls him righteous. It's not based upon his works. He was a believer. And so the blood of Christ atoned for his disobedience there in Genesis 19. Now, let's look at the example on the other extreme. And then we'll, and then we'll close. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 14. Not Corinthians, but Chronicles. Old Testament. 2 Chronicles chapter 14. There is a king here, 2 Chronicles 14, king of Judah, his name is Asa, A-S-A. 2 Chronicles 14, 2 says, And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. For he took away the altars of the strange gods in the high places, and break down the images, and cut down the groves, and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and the commandment. He did wonderful things. He was good and right in the eyes of the Lord. In fact, I'll read you 1 Kings 15, because that's the parallel passage to this. 1 Kings 15, verse 11, says, Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. Verse 14 says, 1 Kings 15, 14, But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. Isn't that a great testimony? Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. Okay, now go back to 2 Chronicles. And look at what happens at the end of his life. 2 Chronicles 16. At the end of Asa's life, 2 Chronicles 17, verse 7. 
And at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Then Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. Verse 12 says, Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. So he had a wonderful reign for the Lord. His heart was perfect before the Lord, but then you get to the very end and he doesn't trust in the Lord. And so God punishes him. Now notice another thing here. Go back to chapter 15. Look at the warning in between here. And this is how you know Asa was not a believer. 2 Chronicles 15, verse 1. 2 Chronicles 15, 1. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye be, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while ye be with him. It's conditional. He's under the law. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. What does Hebrews, look over in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Still Israel's program, but Hebrews is talking to believers. Hebrews 13 verse 5. Hebrews 13, 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. If you are a believer, the Lord will never leave you, nor forsake you. If you are an unbeliever, 2 Chronicles 15, here's Asa. The Lord says he was perfect before me, did, that was, was right. He was a good king in the reforms that he did. But God tells Asa in 2 Chronicles 15 2, If ye forsake him, he will forsake you. This isn't a Bible contradiction. It's God judges you if you are an unbeliever. He judges you based on the law. And if you don't obey it perfectly, God will forsake you. But if you are a believer, God judges you on the merits of Christ. His blood atoning for your sins, and he will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that's the difference. And I, I'm glad that so many people joined us for this message tonight because I think pretty much all denominations, all of churchianity, they're so confused with why is God so the vengeful God of the Old Testament, but he's the loving God of the New Testament? Why is there so much law in the Old Testament and there's grace in the New Testament? And the simple answer is, God judges unbelievers by the law. He judges believers by grace. It's just Israel in the Old Testament are unbelievers. And us in the dispensation of grace and Paul, Paul's writing to believers. So you see grace in Paul's epistles. You see law in the Old Testament. And dear Lord, we just thank you for your word that you've given unto us. We thank you for giving us the Holy Ghost to be able to discern what you say Help us not to put ourselves back under the law to make ourselves a transgressor, but to trust in your grace that has saved us, to live by the faith of the Son of God and, uh, and not worry about those laws, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. We thank you for taking us from under that law that we would never obey by ourselves and that you obey through us through your love. Help us, Lord, to trust in you and your love rather than trying to trust in obeying you through our flesh. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.